Ah, lo compraste poco. Por eso me dijo, vos te La vida tomó la definición. Listo, no me dijo, no, no va a tener otro cartucho, todo lo que sí. Yo quiero pedir para estar con el sax ahora, no puedo hacer un video. Por ahora sí, empezamos para que no se. Bueno, ahí ya. Ok. El video ya está habilitado. Y el zoom dejamos el micrófono. No, pero eso no es el icono de ventana más. Sí, sí, está bien. Está bien.
Ahí ya se está grabando, vamos a escuchar fuera y ahí vuelvo. ¿Y eso? ¿Querés? Sí. Você tem só que me falar quando eu estiver fora da área, porque eu vou começar a caminhar. Aí chegou qualquer coisa. Bueno, eu vou começar porque os alunos que estão aqui já estão. Bueno, bom dia a todos e todas. Les presento a Mateus Cardoso. Mateus é brasileiro, de Rio Grande do Sul, ou seja, quase argentino, praticamente. Mateus é químico, estudou química e tem um doutorado em química. Y ahora, hace muchos años, trabaja en el sincrotrón brasilero. Primero trabajaba en el MLS y ahora está en Sirius, el nuevo sincrotrón del que va a hablar durante la, durante la presentación. Toda la mañana. Toda la mañana de eso va a hablar. Y actualmente él es el jefe de una de las áreas grandes que tiene el sincrotrón, que es la de Soft and Biomaterials. Es una división que tiene a su cargo varias de las líneas del de sincrotrón actualmente. Y les va a contar un poco sobre eso en inglés. O en, o en portugués. No, en inglés. Español, inglés. Portugués. En inglés, pero yo creo que ustedes portugués. le pueden hacer preguntas si quieren en español y sí. nosotros tenemos de traductores si, si, les, si les da vergüenza. Sí. Eh, Interrúmpalo si hace falta, ya arreglamos con Mateus que no hay problema en que le interrumpan. Eh, listo. Esto es tuyo. Muchas gracias por haber gracias. venido. Buenos días. Buenos días. Buenos días. Buenos días. This is all that I can say in <laughs> Castellano. This is not true. I can say a little bit more because I, I was born in the southmost state of Brazil, very close to the border of Argentina. So what I can tell you that uh, I really love Argentina. I really love Argentina, except when we are talking about soccer. But uh, nine, 90 minutes from, 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 from time to time, but except that, I really love Argentina. I, it's, a, it's a huge pleasure to be here. And uh, I really enjoy being with uh, Luz, Galo, Paula, Sara. These guys are, you can trust me, they are the really, really respected in every corner of this world that you can go. I was in, 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 in France, in the Sojal World Conference, Sara was very well recognized. She, she got the biggest prize that you can imagine. So this, you, 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 trust me, you are in the best place that you could be for learning Sojal. Uh, for the next hour, I, you, can, you, can stop me, you can stop me any moment that you want. Please just put your hand or just scream in my face. That's all right. <laughs> And uh, you can make, if you if are not uh, com confident of speaking in English, because I'm not either, you can do your question in, in Castellano, and I will reply in Portuguese, but I'm, I'm <laughs> sure that you can communicate, because until this point, these were the first words that were, I, I was trying to say in English, because yesterday I went to a restaurant, I went to the hotel, and I was trying my best, and you could communicate. So. Don't be shy to make questions. If you stop me anytime, and you can make any kind of question that you want, even in, in, in Castellano. So I will talk about synchrotron. So this is the main entrance. Paulo was there a month ago, more or less. And uh, it's very impressive. I will show you a little bit. And uh, the idea today is that I will show you the synchrotron and I will try to make bridges with solid gel. So I, I was not really very uh, headstrong. I have to find good examples of solid gel. I was much more <clears throat> looking nice examples that could be very illustrative to you rather than finding solid gel examples. Of course, we have solid gel examples. I work with solid gel, but for some specific techniques that are quite new, we don't have solid gel examples. So be uh, and, I, I, and I don't want to, uh, I, I just want to show you nice effects. So to start, this is the synchrotron. It's like, a, it's like a boca. It's the size of Bombonera. It's like river. It's like uh, the monumental size. It's more or less the size of a soccer stadium. It's very big. It takes eight. So my office, it's here. Okay. In the main entrance, like I shown the picture. And these are two beam lines of my division. From here to here, if I walk in a very good pace, take me between six and seven minutes. It's, it's not that uh, 
it's big. It's it's you can then later on talk to Paula and she will tell you that it's big. And uh, it's located in Campinas. Campinas it's about one hour drive from São Paulo. You've probably heard about São Paulo. It's the largest city in Brazil. So it's very convenient because during the weekends you can go to São Paulo. During the weekdays it's impossible because you are always stuck in the traffic jam. We are a non-profit organization that is founded by the Ministry of Science and Technology. Okay, we are a private company, so I can fly back and my director can he can fire me anytime he wants. Uh, that is, I, I'm not a, a public employee. I can <coughs> fire. This is good and this is bad depending on the way you you you, you see the things. The good side is that we, we work very hard, but. The negative side, there are a lot of good people that work there and they decide to leave to get a professorship position because it's very stable, you cannot be fired. You can even kill your team and nothing <laughs> happens to you. But uh, I particularly like working there because it's, it's at the same time, it's chaotic, it's full speed and uh, it's never, you, you never get bored because it's, every time it's different. And here we have four different national labs. We have Sirius, that is here, where I work. We have something happened here. I don't know. And you close. It's all right. No, it's gone. Let me share this share again. Screen. Okay. Oh, yes, yes. The, the people that is watching. That's it. So, and here we have a four different national labs. We have a synchrotron park. This is uh, biorenewable, that it's mostly focused on bioethanol production. You have, you probably have heard that Brazil. Has a very strong research project <laughs> and initiative in bioethanol. We, we use you can go to the gas station and fill your car with ethanol. Here we have biosciences. They are work with uh, biodiversity of Brazil and trying to get molecules that can be used as a drugs. And here is the old synchrotron, and here is the one of the most maybe the most advanced uh, microscope center in, in South America. We have huge microscopes there. So let's talk about C. This is the storage ring. And for those that I imagine that you are here for Soja, you are not here for synchrotron. So I, I, I will explain a little bit the basics. It is kind of uh, weird to imagine, but we have packages of electrons, literally package of electrons that they are here making the full turn. And while they are doing that, this package of electrons, when they change the direction, they, 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 they emit a radiation that's called synchrotron radiation. It's very bright, it's very intense, and it's very powerful for making experiments. This package of electrons, just to give you an idea in space, in the horizontal dimension <laughs> is 10 microns. 10 microns, you take, I don't have much, but for those that you have hair, you take your diameter of your hair, you divide in five, this is 10 microns. In the back, in this direction, in the horizontal direction, in the vertical direction, it's about one micron, you divide your hair in 50, and in the propagation direction is about one millimeter. If you take the electron beam from the beginning, when it starts to appear in a given point, and the point that it disappears, it takes eight picoseconds. So inside of the storage ring, we have 864 packages and the circumference of the storage ring is 518 meters. I will let you follow and read. 
This is an internal tour. I will show you twice. They put it again. There is no need. Could you follow? Yeah. Okay. Next Saturday, the test will be half of the test will be about this. <laughs> okay. All confidence. Good. So, in fact, we have electrons that are produced. We have this more than 800 package of electrons. They have a difference between them, a few nanoseconds. And uh, they are traveling close to the speed of light and they emit radiation. And you take this radiation and you do advanced experiments. So if you look, uh, now I, I will make a little bit of publicity because there are, maybe you are too young for, for this, but I'm sure that Luz and Paula, they remember that many, many years ago, we have a Pentium 1 computer, Pentium 2, Pentium 3, Pentium 4, have you remember that? No? Yeah, some yes, some no. Okay, but it was a kind of a evolution. <laughs> Let me see something that has evolved with time. Maybe cars. You take a car of 2000, a car of 2005, the same. Synchrotrons are more or less the same. They start with second generation machines, then they evolve for third generation machines, and now we have fourth generation machines. This machine that I'm showing you, it's one of the three that you have in the world that it's fourth generation machine. Why it's fourth generation machine? This is because more or less, are you trying to show you the following? I will press this device and the size of the beam here and there is more or less the same because this is a laser. It's coherent and it's a laser. X-rays, they don't behave like a laser. When they are produced here in this magnet, Ideally, they are produced and they have something that is called divergence. If I, if, of course, if I had the power of making the same experiment here with an X ray, I would press here and there, I would have a very big image in the wall. These fourth generation machines, they kind of try to follow the concept of a laser. The size of the beam in the magnet and the size of the beam at the experimental stations are very close to each other. Not exactly close, but the most that we can produce nowadays. And we have the wave front that it's coherent with time and laterally, that it's the most important for solid gel chemistry. Okay? So this is very important. And this is one of the three. We have one in Brazil, one in Sweden, and one in France. And for most of the experiments that we want we, 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 we want to do, the Brazilian synchrotron, is, I wouldn't change. I wouldn't make any kind of deal and go to Sweden or to France. Because for you guys and for me, it's better here because of some characteristics for the energies and the techniques that we want to use. Of course, for other techniques, other synchrotrons might be better. But for what we want to do, it's better here. And here are some parameters. And uh, what is nice here is the following. We have uh, the concept that every lattice, mag magnetic lattice, <laughs> is about one super band and two small ones. So we have five dipoles to make this specific synchrotron radiation that is kind of low divergence and high coherence. For some time, the world 
doubt that it that that was possible and uh, luckily we had a very good machine team that they do calculations and they were able to find out the way that you could produce and then we were the, the first one proposing this kind of organization for the market just for you to have a clue how the machine is working nowadays this is the real beam monitor after the double crystal monochromator at the Manaka beam line. And this is the simulation considering the nominal machine parameters. And the energy here is 9.274 kilo electron volts. There is a huge agreement between both. And the, if I change the energy, see that it follows very, very well. And the emittance and how the beam spreads is measured here. The machine was designed to work at 200 pico meters right radians. And if you follow this curve, it's exactly what you have. So the machine spec, we are delivering what we have. For us. Okay, what correlation, what I'm talking with soldier size? The radiation that it's produced it's from X-rays to infrared. So when we have this package of electrons and they generate radiation, it's not just X-ray, it's not just UV, it's not just infrared. It's every, every kind of energy at once. What we do, we have to filtrate and select what we wanna use, and then we do experiments, okay? If you take here gamma rays and radio waves, we don't, uh, of course, gamma rays, we, we do for medical treatments, we can do for science, but we don't use, we don't have them as a critical energy in synchrotrons. But basically we can spread from X-rays to V and infrared. And these techniques can be used for solid gel studies, okay? Of course, this infrared, you see that we are increasing the wavelength. If we increase the wavelength, we are decreasing the penetration. If I decrease the wave, I increase the penetration. And uh, I was preparing the talk, and uh, there is something that we are playing a lot. And uh, I, I was lucky to find a very good example. <laughs> that is this example here. Visible light. I take the face of this girl, and this is the visible light. Like you are seeing me, and I can see you, right? But if I take the same image, of course, we did not do experiments like I will show you. It is a simulation, <laughs> of course. <laughs> if I take the same face and I try to probe with different kinds of energies, this is very simple and very useful for you. You see x-rays. You have been in hospital very unlucky. You broke your arm or leg or whatever. And this is very useful. We, we, we have seen that so many times. But see, I can use other wavelengths and see different things. I see different contrasts. I see different information. And this is why synchrotron technique can be so useful because you can play with the energy and penetrate more, penetrate less, see chemical bonds, see porous, see entire structure, see a particle and whatever. So depending on how we tune the instrument, we can have different kinds of information. And this is what I'm going to tell you in, in, in the next minutes. But before I go, I would like to show you something that it's, I think it's very illustrative because we are putting a lot of efforts in showing visually things to the people. This is, of course, the simulation. This is a cartoon. This is a cell, okay? And this cell, if we take x-rays now, a coherent x-ray, and you shine over a cell, and you put the detector and the cell very, very close, very, very close, we see this image. Okay. We can see the features. They are not broad. The features are there, but the, but the contrast is very, very small. We don't see much, right? If I put, I call absorption-based microscopy. 
if I go a little bit far, see, now I see all features of myself, but see, I cannot see properly the details because it's, it's kind of blurred. And if I can go even more, of course, then I even more blurred. But when we do that, we can retrieve the coherent wavefront and try to get information out of it. I'm not saying that it's not valid working in the near field or in the Fresnel. I'm just saying that depending on how you probe and how far you put your detector from your sample, you can see different things. <coughs> and what we are using a lot is the Fraunhofer regime. You put the detector really far from the sample, and now you have a diffraction. Okay. But we do diffraction of amorphous materials because we are using a coherent beam. I, 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 go, I, I don't want to go into details, but I just want to show you that if you take X rays now, that I will be talking more about X rays, that we have different kinds of. <laughs> No, how far? We are really far, and I will, start, I will start from it. I will put the detector closer and closer and closer until there is a point that you make the transition to UV and infrared. Okay? Good. The, the synchrotrons we have nowadays uh, beam lines in different kinds of states. So some of them are commissioning. We, we in three weeks, Two weeks we are going to have our user meeting and we are going to open for applications so paula luz gallo they have come many many times for doing experiments with us and you guys you can come as well and uh, if you don't know we pay for you to go there we pay one or two uh flight tickets we pay lodging we pay food and uh, i would have heavily encourage you to to make this this application. We have a, a couple. Of, we have a couple of B lines. Is the the, the 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 green ones that are already commissioned and will be open for the users in two weeks. We have some that are in installation, assembly, and project. If we divide the LNLS to talk about science in the, the near future, the LNLS we have a director. Then we have three divisions that are technical divisions and three divisions that are scientific divisions. The technical division, one is for the accelerator itself. One is for uh, engineering from the accelerator until the detector. And this one is for data acquisition and data processing from the detector to the data. And then we have three scientific divisions. One for material size and, and and uh, part from this and matter, hierarchical division, hierarchical materials and heterogeneous materials, and soft and biological matter division. And nowadays, today, I will talk about these six beam lines to you. Okay, we start now with one beam line that it's not really related to, to solve but I would like to show you the first beam line that was implemented. How is it working? and uh, how the next one will be working. Okay, questions? You are looking at me like a fund of uh, intending to follow? See, no? Preferring Diablo, Abduablo Espanol? <laughs> no? I think it's way worse than my English. <laughs> okay, should I keep going? <coughs> Good. This beam line is not really related to to sol gel, but I would like to show you because we I, I'm very proud of this beam line. I will tell you why. March of 2020, you, you remember, beginning of the pandemics, we 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 were we we have a twelve yeah thousand two hundred people working at CDS, mostly students, engineers, and so on. It's a lot of people. And we were pushing hard six beam lines. Then March of 2020, pandemic started, and we have to stay at home. But I, I will not talk about politics. But our president said, no, you cannot stay at home. You have to keep working. You have to keep moving. At, at some degree, they were right. And you keep moving, but uh, with some degree of uh, protection, self-protection. 
Then instead of moving six to five bin lines, we decide, okay, let's focus on one single bin line. And this bin line is the bin line can help somehow the Latin America to work with COVID. So this manaka, it's the protein crystallography bin line. So it's not related at all with salt gel, but I'd like to show you just for you to have a clear view of what we can do with the other bin lines. Because although we do experiments, the other bean lines are delayed because of the pandemics, are not fully automatized like this is fully automatized. And I would like to show you the degree of automatization. So this is Manaka. It's the protein crystallography bean line. Basically, we have we shine X-ray beam in a protein crystal. We have diffraction spots. And these diffraction spots, we can retrieve the structure and atomic positions of proteins. So this is the first exp su successful experiment, I would say, not the first, but first successful experiment that we, we did at this beam line. And uh, these are the beam line scientists. They were very happy. Mm -hmm. we, we were working with lysozyme. It's a very <coughs> simple protein, very simple crystal. And here is the size of the, 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 the beam at the sample position. This is the diffraction spectra, diffraction, uh, uh, diffractometer, and this is the, the parameter that uh, <coughs> we were all very happy. This is the crystal, and it's quite big. Of course, we have to start with something very simple. Uh, the beam is one third of this uh, blue. Uh, ring and nowadays we are working with very very tiny what i want to show you is this uh, because i know that's not really solved out but the automatization is where we are looking at you are going to see that it's fully automatized so argentinians they send frozen crystals to us we, we put inside of a dealer and there is a robot that picks the, the crystal, put in front of the beam, do the measurement, take the crystal, put it back, and keep moving, moving, moving. And I will show you a little bit. I will try to explain what happens. So this is the, the robotic arm. The robotic arm will lead the room. And there is a sample there. It's going to pick the sample. You can see the sample, we're going to see in a minute. You put the sample back in the liquid nitrogen. You are going to see that it's going to move a little bit to take the next sample. Then, yes, it's taking the second sample. It's going to put in the sample stage. And now we are going to move to see the sample is here. so see now the robot is leaving the sample is here this is for uh, uh, keep it cold a microscope will show up here very soon yeah microscope showing up this is the crystal that they're going to measure you put it on the focus and then you just select okay I want to measure this part, put it into the center because the beam is here. So now the guy has to align it. The crystal is here inside of this loop. He makes a little bit of rotation. Okay, this is the center. Say where the center is. It's centered, and then you shoot. And, yeah. and of course, the guy was doing the experiment there, but you can do the, this experiment from your home. You don't need to go there. We have a, a users from Argentina, from Chile. <laughs> now we have a, a user from Russia, but they decide to come because they want to leave Russia. <laughs> so they, they are nowadays, today, they are doing experiments. This is the level of implementation that we are pushing a lot for all beam lines. Of course, if you go to Caterete, the beam line that Paula wants to use, if you go there, <laughs> the level of automatization is not at that level. But this beam line is one year ahead of all others. But I'd like to show you, not because of the soldier, but just to give an impression what we can do and what we are going to do. But, okay, so they 
work a lot in the beginning, work with uh, SARS-CoV-2, so they have a protein and so on, published papers and so on, so that there was a lot of publicity about SARS-CoV and so on. But let's talk about soja. Caterite. Caterite is, I know that Luz was talking about uh, DLS yesterday. This bean line is able to do a kind of DLS, the same thing that DLS does, but with x-rays and also imaging, depending on the way we are going to work. If you have already heard about small angle x-ray scattering, this is the experiment, but it's not with partially coherent beam, we use fully coherent beam. And then we can do different things what we do compared to that. This is catenity. And basically we shine the sample with a coherent beam and you have what we call a speckle pattern. Instead of have a, a ring like with a par partially coherent, coherent beam, we have a speckle pattern. It's like a diffraction pattern. But the speckle is different from diffraction because we can shine liquids. We can shine amorphous material. We can shine any kind. And all of them, they will produce a speckle pattern. Mm -hmm. Then there are two ways that we can work at this beam line. The most challenging one is imaging. This speckle pattern, you can make the, the inverse Fourier. And then if you make this loop, <coughs> You can try to retrieve the shape of the object that you, that, that, that you are shining, that you are probing. Basically, you take the light, interacts with the sample. We have this speckle. You make the, 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 the inverse Fourier, and then it should give you back the shape of the object, the 2D shape of the object. If you, if you iteratively do that for different kinds of angles, then you can have your 3D object. <laughs> Although it looks very simple and practical, it's very simple. We are talking in, at this beam line resolution of 20 nanometers. And when you say about 20 nanometers, imagine that I'm, I'm moving and I'm rotating my sample and I, I have to be able to retrieve this 20 nanometers. 30, 40, okay, let's imagine 50. It's, it's, it's giant, you, you are doing synthesis here and you, they realize that 50 is huge. This B line is the aim to, to reach 20 nanometers in 3D space. <laughs> and the second one is like Luz was talking yesterday. If you take this <coughs> pattern, then you see the evolution over time. It's like doing DLS, but instead of using laser, we are using X-rays. The advantage is that we can measure opaque samples, you can measure solid samples, you can measure gel, you can measure whatever you want. The limitation is the detector frame rate. The experiment that Luz is able to do with DLS, if you take a 20 nanometer nanoparticle, okay, and you are seeing the diffusion in water, we are not able to make this diffusion because our detector rate is not fast enough to get this 20 nanometers diffusion. This is why it's very nice because if I take a 20 nanometer nanoparticle, I go to DLS. But if I take 20 nanometer nanoparticle, very complex fluid like blood, I, I'm doing that. I cannot go to DLS because DLS cannot see that. But if I go there, I can see because it's very complex, it's highly viscous, it's red, it's full of things, and even then I can differentiate things. I have a postdoc position. If you want to apply, please talk to me. Can I? <laughs> you don't need to apply, you just come. <laughs> okay, so this is satellite. We have here inside of this rush, we have here uh, where we do the experiment. We have different kinds of sample borders that I'll show you in a minute. This is where we do imaging, we do of course, depending on the experiment, we have to change the sample holder. And then we have 30 meters long tunnel because we are in the front half region. We have to have we have to amplify this spectrum. This is why. Then we have to really be far from the center. So this is vacuum. We have a tray, a rail that makes the, 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 the detector 
we can move the detector back and forth depending on where we want. But most of the time, we work at 27 meters. That's it. basically the most that we can do in this time. We have a couple of uh, sample holders. So we, we have uh, sample holders that are very versatile, work silicon nitrate, capillaries for liquids, solids, and everything. We have inline optical microscope because we have to be able to see the sample if we decide to rotate the sample in front of the. This is most of the time the kind of uh, sample holders that we use for imaging. We have now this uh, environment controlled humidity chamber because we, we wanna, I, I will show them what we wanna do. And you have this helium and liquid nitrogen screen to keep the sample frozen if needed. Most of the, the, most of the case we need that. One of the main tasks of this beam line is to be able to make the full 3D mammalian cell with 30, 40 nanometers resolution. And uh, what I wanna do specifically, I wanna localize silica nanoparticles inside of the cells. We do that with electron microscopy, we do that with fluorescent microscopy, but we wanna see in 3D where the particles are going. This is what I do for uh, as research. Nowadays, this is a KD cell. We can see the nucleus, we can see the cytoplasm, but we don't see the organelles for now because the cryostream, the device that keeps the sample frozen, was broken. And uh, when you do the experiments at room temperature, these experiments, they have, they are done in about three to four, six hours, depending on the size of the cell. The cell does not survive, so we cannot see the organelles. We are basically destroying the organelles. It's so intense to be. We have to froze the sample. And this is another sample. This is let me stop here. This is a native cell. This is it's called cardiomyocyte. It was extracted from a mouse. And uh, in this case, we were able to discriminate mitochondria nucleus and chromatin but this is why uh, we, we were able to discriminate because this cell is very resistant but we know that we have to improve that a lot and for you guys i just want to show you this example because this example is very nice if you work with zero gels or aerogels and you have a porous in your system any kind of porosity in your system you can probe See, this is five microns. So this sample here is about 20 by 20 microns. And uh, this was a ciliated polymer, if I'm not wrong, but it doesn't matter. What matters here is what we can do with this technique. If you have a, a porosity in your system, <laughs> you can easily take a very large sample and get to a resolution that it's very small, like 40, 50, 30, or even 20. It depends on what? Depending on the size of the sample, depending on the contrast of your sample, depending on a lot of things. Because when you see resolution now, we don't see resolution in 2D. Most of the time that you see microscopy, you look from top to the bottom, you have a square, but now the resolution is no longer a square, it's a cube. It's no longer more a pixel, it's now a voxel. And the resolution of a voxel is always smaller than the resolution in 2D. This is why the most from the theoretical point of view is 20, but for this polymer, if I'm not wrong, it was 40. So here you can see that we have the matrix of the polymer, we have the space, and uh, here there is a video that you can see. We are still improving the segmentation in these videos. Some of them are going to be they are very nice, some are not really, but you can at least see something. But the most important here is that you can go there, even if you have a very tiny porous that you cannot measure for any other kind of technique. You can even see for TM, 
but the M will never give you any kind of quantitative information. You can go there and see interconnectivity. You can measure sizes. You can see everything because it's the full piece. If you if you go for TM, you have to slice. It's like if you take an apple, you take a, a tiny slice of the apple. The, the slice of the apple is not really the apple. It's just a slice of the apple, right? This is a easy question. Yes, please. Sorry. What kind of material is Use any material you want. Any material. As we are probing the sample with coherent beam, the contrast is native. We are basically seeing electronic things. Of course, if you take uh, two polymers that are basically the same, we cannot discriminate them. But we have a polymer water, polymer, and whatever. You have a silica matrix and any kind of. We, we, we see things. Because we see electron difference, we don't we don't see the material. But you have two materials that have some some electric some electron contact. It's okay. Even if they are very close, yeah. we can play with the distance, like I show in the cartoon. And then you, there are some. Uh, of course, it depends on the size, depends on the material. But depending on how far and how close we are to the detector from the sample, we can enhance differences. And there are some techniques like infrared that I will show you in the very end. Infrared is native for the chemical bonds. So we have a simulated something and something that's simulated with another thing. We can easily discriminate them. Okay. So this is the most complex example that was done at the beam line with tapolin. So this is like microscopy. <coughs> this is TM. But here is the 3D that was taken at the beam line. And see, this is the starch that we have inside of this volume. And you see just a few of them. But when you go to 3D, you can count, you can measure, you can say the volume, you can say everything. And you can do the same for you, for aerogel, for your zero gel, for, because it's quantitative. This is very important to us. And just to finish, uh, as I saw that Ruth was talking about DLS, so I summarize in one slide for you guys. This is gold nanoparticle in glycerol and water, just to speed the decrease the, the, the fusion. What we do, we shine x-rays on the sample, and over time, we analyze this, the speckle pattern at different Q rings. Basically, we have a Sachs pattern, and this is the 2D, and this is uh, you, you, you can integrate and have this the SACS pattern. And for every Q range, we have a decay. And if I plot the relaxation time against the Q square, I have a, a, a linear, of course, depending on the system, but most of the case, I have a linear representation that crosses the zero zero. And then you can probe about that dynamics, you can probe, you can have the uh, radius of uh, how, the radius of the particle. You can probe the the kind of movement that the particle or whatever you are probing are getting if it's diffusive or whatever kind of diffusion and so on. Okay, I don't want to go too much in the details, but the idea here is more or less what Luz was talking yesterday. The difference is that now I have a probe that is able to do the same experiment, but instead of having a very clean, a very well-behaved solution, suspension, I can now have a very complex system. Okay? Good. Wow. I'm very good. And this is an <laughs> it's okay. And this is another experiment because uh, there is one of the scientists working at the, the at the Caterete Bing Line Alini, and she also worked with Soljao. And her work, she works with, uh, she's forming gels. You know, now more than I do. She's forming gels through this hydrogen condensation and put gold nanoparticles because gold is her catalyst. And her idea, she's probing this formation over the time with XPCS. And the ultimate material, she's trying to do the 3D 
and so she's trying to correlate the diffusion, how the material is getting formed and how the final material, uh, the shape and the morphology of the final material. So it's the work that combines the time evolution with the ultimate structure of sun. Okay. And the idea is to have microscopic organization and mobility, uh, macroscopic for properties and so on. I'm talking too slow, I, I have to speed up a little bit. <laughs> so, Karaunga. Also, we have most of the time a coherent beam. So, but now the beam is focused. And you have a beam that can be very tiny. They are now working between 100, 300. 80 nanometers by 80 nanometers beam. And then you scan your sample. It's really cool because you, it's a multitask uh, beam line. So you can do diffraction, you can do fluorescence, you can do absorption with eight nanometers a step. So it means that you can scan a sample with X-ray, so the penetration like X-rays and so on, and have the resolution that it's very tight. And I took an example that is not at all related to sodium, but I will show you the complexity. And this is kind of is the longest beam line that we have. So the, the experimental hut is there. It's 160 meters away from the source. And uh, we have two hutches. The first hurt is this one. And you are going to see that you have a lot of detectors. This is the diffraction detector, this is diffraction, this is fluorescent detector. And the sample stays here. Okay, we have been coming in this direction. We have a lot of detectors at the table. And we are going to have the second hutch where the beam is going to be even smaller. And they wanna they wanna have the world record in terms of diffraction. They wanna have a beam of 10 by 10 and maybe getting diff diffractions, resolution in terms of diffraction above one nanometer. That for X-rays, it's the basically the limit. But the second branch is not ready yet. This is the same carbon myocyte I showed you before. And uh, what they have done, they have done the following. They took a part of this carbon myocyte and they, do, they did a mapping of chemical elements, because this is a work of one of our partners at Eleno Bio. They work with uh, cardiac problems. We are trying to see the morphology, and uh, this beam line is trying to see if the chemical elements that we have there may play a role in cardiac problems. So here is just an example where they are probing calcium, zinc, and chloride you can do maps. So if you are doping your sample with something, you can go there and see where the dopings are. This is another example. This is a root. And I decided to show you here because it's, it's very complex, the manipulation of this root. So this is millimeter size. This is half a millimeter. And they wanted to do this part here. Then we, we, are, we are full of sample prep labs. And in these labs, you go there, you prepare your sample with our help, of course. And then this part here was imaged here. And they were able to correlate iron, magnesium, and titanium. Because these uh, roots, they were subjected to pollution. And this is just to, I took this example just to show you how we can correlate things. If you have any kind of doping in your sample, if you are doping your sample with something, you can go there and see with very high precision. And this was the first correlative experiment that we did. I don't know if you have heard about correlative experiment. You take one technique, you do another technique, another technique, and then you combine both and you do something that you call correlative, uh, correlative, in this case, correlative microscopy. So this is the experiment that was done by 3D. So in 3D, we have the 3D of this 
uh, I think this is what a small piece of rock. So this is the, 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 the rock that was reconstructed. You are just looking at different views. So this is the front view. Here is maybe they have changed the view in this direction. I don't exactly know. And all these here are related to the elements. I cannot read, but it's iron, nickel, and something. And you can correlate in the space the 3D volume with where you can find a given element. Because when you do the 3D reconstruction that I showed before, you cannot see elements. You can see space, you can see voids, but you cannot see elements. But if you combine both techniques, you can see the full reconstruction, the 3D thing, at the same time that you have chemical information like we have here. So here in the middle is the combination of the mapping that was done with the chemical information and here the pure structure. And here we are combining both. And see how the overlap, it's quite good. And it takes ages for these guys for doing that. It's not for presenting, it's two minutes, but for doing this thing is a nightmare. Okay. Just to show you that if you have something in mind that have structure, you have poros, you have voids, you have something, and you have and you want to combine even this information with chemical information, we can do that. Of course, if not, you can do that. You go there and you just do a measurement because it's not it, but it takes a lot of time, but it's possible. So magnum, it's uh then we, we, we are leaving the nano to micro, more micro world. <laughs> but uh, this big line is nice because I do remember that Roberto, I think Roberto gave classes mm -hmm. to you, right? Roberto Candal, mm -hmm. they came to us with some, I don't remember exactly, you can ask him later. He came time ago with very nice materials for these experiments. Okay. Because mm -hmm. from time to time, you want to see 20, 50, 100. But if you are just below one micron, this technique is amazing, and I will explain you why. The samples here, they, they are much larger. Of course, you cannot probe with the techniques I showed you, you cannot probe an elephant, mm -hmm. because you cannot image an elephant with 10, 20 nanometers resolution, it's insane. So the larger the object, the smaller is the resolution. The smaller, I say, uh, it's, you have to be careful. The smaller resolution, it means that it, we are looking at micro now. Okay, higher resolution we are seeing is smaller. Did you pet? Did you? Okay. Good. So with this technique, we have a conic beam like I have here. The sample goes from millimeter to centimeters. Now much larger samples, but now we cannot no longer see 20 nanometers. We are probing way larger samples. We have a conic beam, and this conic beam is used to image the following. Imagine that we have a cone, I will leave the, the, the screen now. Here in the cone, I have 100 nanometers. The focus is 100 nanometers. There, the size of the beam is 8 centimeters. The idea is the following. Here, we have a very big beam. Of course, this is way more than 8 centimeters. But we have a very big beam. We are imaging a big sample. You are going to image the sample and you are going to localize the interest zone of your sample. It's going to be translated to the focus and then you are going to amplify a very tiny part of your sample. So it's like you do the first experiment here, you have your full object and then you have a, a rail where you translate your sample you choose the region that you want to measure and you do the measurement in high resolution, but then you lose everything else. We call it as Google Maps approach. Why? Because if I go to Google Maps and type Buenos Aires, I see everything, right? But if you want to see Uber, you cannot see Uber. But if, okay, if you type Uber, you don't see Buenos Aires anymore. So the idea is, is, okay, 
first we are going to image the big object like okay the analogy we are going to image buenos aires and then you find well, uber it's more or less here then you translate the sample and we are going to focalize and image this specific region okay this is one example i have a lot of biological examples because i work in the interface between soil gel chemistry and biology so this is why i have a lot of uh, biological examples but you can translate to any kind of things that is it's in half a micron to hundreds of microns can be imaged in this so this is uh, it is good if i turn the lights off no? well here yeah i will go back and then i will because if, if, if i keep the lights like this they are going to follow this i'm sure so every region that we we can discriminate here this is a heart of uh, a mouse and uh, at some point you are going to identify individual cells so this is one individual cell all these dots here can you see these dots are individual cells you can see that you are getting better and better in this movie that you are lunch <laughs> okay okay this is a, a mouse heart but there are a lot of different kind of things that can be done as i said here is the zoom region this is the no zoom at e region and uh, specifically for us see this is a part of like scripture <laughs> and you can have a, a general view and then you can zoom in and for soil gel science this technique is very useful for understand 3d process through soil gel and we can follow the, the soil gel formation because in this case depending on the size that you are probing we have one 3d tomogram per second it's a huge amount of data you can you you cannot use a regular computer to make all kind of data analysis because it's insane the amount of data that you have we have one three D per second so if you have something soil gel process happening in a couple of minutes a formation of something in a couple of minutes you can have three D time frames where your time step is one second and this is one example. This was some wires inside of this porous structure. I should have done a better job to better explain you, but I don't remember what matters. It's, it's a, por a polymeric structure, it's full of porous. The blue one is the material, the red one is the porous. I will show you again. And they have some wires inside that I don't remember what they are, what the wires are. Good. Okay, questions. Are you following me? Does me think me? If I would be Maradona, if I never see that one, or no? Do you understand? Yes. You can explain it. Like I told you, I'm not going to answer. I'm going to make questions very difficult. Okay. Questions? No. You're so very timid. Good. I will keep moving. So, up to now I was talking about X-rays. Remember this box when you have the penetration? That's huge. Now I will move to a regime where there is no much penetration. The beam can no longer penetrate the the, the material. We are basically probing the surface. From one side, it's good. 
homocyte is bad. It's bad because we can no longer see the entire structure because penetration is very small now. But it's really good because the way that the radiation interacts with the material can give us information that we cannot have when we have strong X rays penetrating and passing through the cell. So, this is why I showed you this image of this female where we could see X rays we were basically looking at the bones. When you were moving to UV or infrared, you could see some information. Of course, I don't know exactly the information, but the information was there. We, 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 we had chemical information there, and this chemical information can be used. So, Cedro is the bin line that it's dedicated for circular dichroism. And uh, what we have here is we have a modulator, elastic modulator, hot elastic modulator, that makes the light be circularly polarized to the left, circularly polarized to the right, then interacts with our sample, and then we have detector. In the detector, we can get information out of it. Which kind of information? The information is mainly, up to now, it's mainly related to proteins and carbohydrates. But we are talking about chirality. And depending on the precursor that we are using, you might have chirality in your own system. And this is why we want to move a little bit this kind of signs slowly because we don't have time and we don't have people who don't have money for doing that. But this is at least an idea for you. I, th there is one guy that it's called uh, David Abner. Uh, I don't know how much you are in the soldier field and following the big guys, but like the big guys we have here in the school, there is David Abner. And the guy is, al is, is already thinking about this kind of strategy. I discussed it with him time ago and he's very interest in having salt gel process with chiral structures, either in trapping chiral structures like proteins. He, he did a lot of experiments in trapping proteins, for example, or generating chiral salt gel materials that can be studied in this, in this kind of big line. So this is why I'm telling you, I don't have examples because this bin line is new. There are only two bin lines like this one in the world. And they are fully optimized for exclusively doing protein science. Our bean line is way more versatile and have a lot of possibilities of doing, for example, material science. So, but what we have basically here, just to illustrate, we have alpha helix, beta sheets, and they have different kinds of signals. We have, we have carbohydrates, they have different kinds of signals as well. And this is why these biomolecules that are naturally chiral, they have been mostly studied in this kind of uh, bean line, but it's not extreme. I will show you the bean line that will be inaugurated next week. We are doing experiments offline, but uh, Wednesday of next week is the first day that's bean line. You have been in the equipment that this is the equipment that will be moved to the last room I will show you in a minute. This is the control room of the beam line. And the equipment will be installed here. And I will show you now what, what I have been doing. As I said, I work with silicon nanoparticles. And my work nowadays is trying to find hotspots of science that you can use synchrotron radiation, these new techniques. And uh, as I work in this nanobio interface using silica particles, I always talk about silica particles. This is what I wanna, what, what, what I learned to do in the lab. <coughs> but basically we have a silica particle and there is one effect that's called protein corona. When the particles go inside of your bloodstream, the bloodstream, we have more than thousand different proteins. These proteins that are very well trained to absorb on surface of foreigner structures like particles, virus, cells, bacteria, and so on. This is why 
This is why we don't die of uh, any kind of infection because our body is very well trained. What we have been using, and I will show you a br a briefly what we have been doing. We are we know how to control the adsorption of these proteins on the surface of the particles. And most of the studies are done with bovine serum albumin. Okay, because it's very cheap. Very cheap. It's cheap. Human serum albumin, it's very expensive. For me, at least it's very expensive. They have 76% of similarity. But all process that's happening in our body. It's driven by HSA, human serum albumin, not by BSA, bovine serum albumin. And we found a very nice hotspot because see here, we synthesize silica nanoparticles of different sizes. Here I'm showing 80 in 120 nanometers. And here I have the spectra of BSA bovinum, and this is the thermal denaturated BSA. See that our particles coated with BSA, they follow exactly the spectra of the native BSA. Exactly the spectra. Irrespective of the size. We have 40 nanometers, that is not clear. We have 40, 80, and 120. Here, we are probing HSA. This is the native one. This is the, the denaturated one. And see that the particles are in between. So it means that when we put the particles inside of the bloodstream, the HSA, this is our guess, the HSA absorbs, changes the structure, and sends signals for macrophages, for example, to come and make the, the role okay, let's get rid of these particles. If, well, of course, we did not prove yet, but. Our aim is to prove that it's the secondary structure modification that it's driven biological processes. And this is, can only be done by using this kind of technique. Of course, it's not sol gel, but it was in this example, I used a sol gel chemistry to tune the particles to better see the effect that one has seen. Okay, so in this bar, in this beam line, there are two different kinds of possibilities. Either you tune what you want to see the effect that you want, or you have to produce a chiral system to be probed in this kind of uh, device. Okay? Yes. You have to take out the particle? No. Okay. To measure with the particle in the sample. Yeah, what we do, we know how to form, in this case, we have a monolayer of proteins. When you prepare this monolayer, we have the excess of protein. It's not a perfect binding. We have to put them in excess of protein. This experiment here was done with 80 and 120 because this size, we can centrifuge and get suspend. And then you clean the solution. And then I get rid of the free proteins. What I cannot have in this experiment is the free protein. For the 40 ones, I have to make dialysis for Two weeks probably, and this is why the data is not here because I took uh, last evening the slide and then <laughs> I didn't have the updated one. Okay, so the particles we can make uh, the subtraction of them in the spectra, but what prevents a very good measurement is the free protein in this specific case. Okay. So I go for the very last one. So X rays, I talk a lot, but we have more. Then I was in UV, now I go to infrared that is in Google. This is for me, it's very amazing. What I will show you here, it's, uh, it's really impressive. And these guys here, they are, I think they are the most professional, the, the best professional that we have there. They are really impressive. So here, again, I, I, I don't want to talk about infrared with you. So I, I could have put it here, uh, silica infrared spectra that uh, I, I don't know if somebody- Yes, yes, yes really Beatrice, it's possible. Okay, so you know better than I do, 2000, 2000 something, blah, blah, blah. And uh, here we have the, the, the infrared, and this is a very bad example. I could have put in a silica stuff, but I didn't. 
I did a bad job. But what matters here is the bin line. What we have here, we have uh, one of these, uh, the source, right, the magnets. We have the beam that comes, and we have two experimental stations. One is for nano infrared spectroscopy, and the other one is for micro infrared spectroscopy. How it works? So, before I will show the stations. <laughs> so, this is the micro infrared. Okay. Here is the control station. And this is the nano infrared, like I showed you before. This is the exit of the beam. This is the nano, and then we go, and there is the micro infrared that's there on the other side. But the way it works, it's really nice. And I will show you our best bets. For the micro, although there are plenty of possibilities for material science, what we are really putting a lot of efforts in differentiating biological tissues. When a pathologist takes a tissue for, for making the diagnostic for this is tumoral, this is healthy, this is, it's looking at this kind of image. Now compare with the same image, if the contrast is no longer a marker, but the contrast is the native chemistry chemical structure of the tissue. <coughs> Look at the difference. So we believe we are we are working with some, when I say we, we as an institution, I, I'm, I'm not scientifically involved in this kind of study. We are working close to pathologists and we believe that instead of using these chemical markers, we can use the na native chemistry of the tissue and be able to discriminate between healthy and tumoral tissue, for example. Okay, but everything that you have in the micro range, if you are able to make fools of silica, if you have a, this micro, uh, uh, say, device that you can do micro things, right? You can make micro needles and micro, you can obviously use. But the most intriguing and the most amazing technique for me is this one that we have at the nano station. Most of you, you know about atomic force microscopy, AFM, that you have a tip and you scan the surface of your material. You have a volume. And what you can do after you do an AFM, we can go on the surface of this material, shine synchrotron infrared light and get spectroscopy for every pixel that we want. And this is very nice because, so here we have a, a, a insulin fibers and see depending on the wavelengths that you are probing it, you can see chemical information with resolution of 25 nanometers. I will show you one of my examples and you know if it's here, yeah, it's here. We published it a couple of, uh, two years ago, I think. Uh, these are silica particles. I coated them with gluconamide, that it's a sugar. And then this sugar can interact with the outermost membrane of the bacteria, gram negative bacteria, this is E. coli. It's a very simple solid gel chemistry. We do the, the particle, we do the functionalization, the seal, the silane is ready, we don't need to make it. But we have the particle coated with this carbohydrate, and then it sticks on the surface of the bacteria. This is the AFM. And we take this AFM and you choose a given region of this AFM and you did spectroscopy for all of these points that we have here in these columns. This is this fingerprint of silica that you might recognize. Of course, we are in the nano regime. We are not talking about bulk. 
but in the nano regime. So this is this silica fingerprint. But what for us, what it's changing, it's not the silica, what's changing is the membrane of the bacteria that have proteins. And if you follow this amide one band, we clearly see a shift from here to here. And this shift is related when you go from this point to the surface of the particle. When we are at the interface between the particle, we are probing literally the interface between the particle and the membrane of the bacteria, we see a huge shift. And this shift is attributed because the particle, although interacting with the outermost surface, we have just below that, we have proteins. And we are there looking at this amide one, amide two bands. We are looking at the secondary structure of the proteins. So basically, we can do <coughs> an AFM and get structural information because we change the way we are doing. We shine light on the tip and then you do spectroscopy. Now, the particles I showed you before, I don't have here, I think. No. What we are doing now, it's very challenging. We, we, we are taking one particle, silica particle, coated with, uh, with protein, and you are doing spectroscopy on the surface of a single particle with 25 nanometer resolution. And the results were really cool. We just acquired that. I will ask my postdoc if he's able to send me today the data. I will show you tomorrow. Okay. Good. Then I will just okay. jump. How much time does it take to you or the postdoc to do all these analysis measurements? How? How long? So uh, the point is, for making a monolayer of uh, a single monolayer of proteins around the, a, a particle, took a PhD. Okay. But now we know how to do that. So when the postdoc came, he knew before how he, he didn't know, but we, we knew how to do this. And he took from this moment on. He's working one year with CD and infrared, more or less, too. Because the data are separated, but they are the same. But uh, basically, one year. And we are very close to get a full story. So my time is finishing. I would like to invite you to visit our website. There are a lot of training, even digital training. There are a lot of courses. Our user meeting is still uh, open for applications, for uh, online applications. It's very cheap. If you don't have money, you just write to us and say, I don't have money, please, but I want to follow the user meeting. I will grant you because I'm the one saying yes or no. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure that I will grant you because, but don't do that if you if, only if you don't have money and you wanna be part of it. But uh, uh, so we have user meeting. We have a lot of schools. We have a lot of. Uh, we are more and more uh, stimulating people to 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 get used and use these advanced techniques. And uh, especially for you guys, because it, it, it's, it's, it's somehow really bad to say, your science level is way better. We cannot compare with the Brazilian one. I always say that. If you take the average level of science, when we are talking about chemistry, when you talk about uh, material science, you guys will do way better than you do in Brazil. So for, for us, it's always a huge pleasure to have Argentinians at the Bing line, because when they go there, they literally, they study and they know what they want to do. So it's, 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 it's really good. So uh, many years ago, I said, okay, let's move the synchrotron to Buenos Aires. Let's build series at Buenos Aires. They wanted to kill me, but uh, everybody agreed that uh, the Argentinian users are the best ones. You are, you are really great. So Sirius is, uh, just to conclude, Sirius is a, an advanced tool. I try to convince you at least that must be explored to all science, all, all fields of science. I try to show a variety of techniques, some of them available, and there are much more to come. I showed you <coughs> six big lines. 
And uh, the first phase, we are going to have 14 bin lines. So I, I didn't show you half of it. Uh, we are trying to build state of the art equipment. Although it's difficult, we are pushing, we are trying our hard. The whole CDOS team is ready and available to help the users community, especially in the new techniques. I specifically think that there are these techniques I showed you are the most promising ones for the soil gel science. I showed you that I'm using most of them. I showed you my examples, what I'm doing. And uh, CDOS, in my opinion, is the scientific Latin America treasure. And you have to use it. You don't pay for using it. It's for free. And uh, there is no excuse uh, why not to use. So you, you have to use it. It makes a huge impact in your postdoc work or PhD thesis, whatever. It makes a huge difference if you take one of these advanced techniques and you try to probe different things. I'm, I discussed with Paula one month ago that I'm I still work with the nano bio interface, but now I was totally focused on one thing, but now with this Disney world of uh, equipment, I'm literally playing with the techniques harder than with the system. So I study the technique and I imagine a question. And then I, as we are, most of you, I imagine a chemist as well. You can go back to the lab and generate systems to answer questions that the technique can give you. And uh, we are having some kind of success over the time. And I would like to encourage you to, to do the same because it makes a huge difference. And, uh, and I think this is way better than if you just change fluoride by chloride by bromide. And mm -hmm. This is not science. You have, you, you have to think uh, out of the box and then uh, try to do different and I finished showing you this uh, video that it's uh, a nice video. We, we, we can see you from the top. <laughs> we can see a little bit of containers in the back. Containers. Because it is not in downtown containers, a bit out of the city. And uh, I'd like to thank again the organizers for the opportunity. You see that's my pleasure to be here. And, uh, and I'd like to thank for, for all your attention because as far as I saw, there is only one or two that were about to sleep, but uh, <laughs> most of you, you kept quite well during this half an hour. And uh, thanks a lot for, for your attention. Questions, right? You don't like making questions. I will make questions then. Ah, good. If you don't do, I will. <laughs> I love your presentation. Thanks. Um, I, I imagine that the raw data that you acquire from Singleton is not something that you can analyze the Yes. How does the user uh, get to the information that they need? Okay. Tomography, you cannot analyze in your computer. Okay. If you, if you take a circular dichroism or infrared, you can analyze in your computer because then it's a, it's a text file like you have in your DLS or your UV or, you know, it's a text file. So UV, UV, CD and infrared, yes. You take the data, you bring it home and you do whatever you want. Although we help users in analyzing data because although it's infrared, <laughs> When you do nano infrared, there are effects that are not present when you do ATR or a KBR uh, transmission experiment in infrared, for example. But for tomography, we have uh, a center at Sirius that when you have bin time and you are working with tomography, you have also time allocated to this computer center that you can do while you are there or at home. It's not illimited, but we have, we provide all the tools for you to get access and open because it's two, three terabytes of data. You, you don't open in a regular computer. You have to use supercomputers. So when you go there, 
you have pre-visualization of the data, but when you want to do the segmentation that you call as, okay, this is my silica matrix, this is my poros, I want to get volume, size, and so on. It's uh, heavy math that it's behind of it. Then you have to use these supercomputers, and then you have time allocated to it. But they, I'm sorry, there's another person which you, you say, for example, I want to know the volume of the spores, so please help me find out. Or... Yeah, so the point is our work in theory, our work goes until the moment that you acquire a very good data. This is our general work. This is why I have never published with Paula because a Paula goes to the bin line and my main job is okay. I want to get Paula to get the best data and she knows how to do from the data onwards. If you don't know how to do that, we have courses. You can go through the courses. There are a lot of online courses. You can take the online course, start, not now, next, not next, yeah. After the exam. After, after the exam, you can, it's for free, but even if you need help, then you have to communicate with the bin line staff and say, okay, please, I want to do that. I wanna... For XPCS, for example, for Nanotomo, basically all users that are coming, they are collaborators. But for example, there is a group from INIFTA, that's Marcelo Seolin and Agustin Pico. They went for XPCS, and they said, okay, I'm happy with the data and uh, we are going to analyze our data by ourselves. And they, they know how to do that. They never, they have never done before, but they know how to do it. They are doing and we are not with them. This is part of our, we are not parasites. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the most important thing, <clears throat> we are not, we, we, we imagine that all users come, they want to collaborate. We don't have hands. Most of the bin lines, they have two or three scientists. And imagine Saks Bing Line. I was in charge of Saks Bing Line, like a Caterite Bing Line. We had about 80 groups per year. Imagine if every group has one paper, I could handle 80 papers per year. You know, it's, it's insane. So it's important that our main job, our main work is forming the community. So maybe the, the scientists will tell you, okay, we are going to collaborate in the first. I will show you how to do. And then from this point forward, you go by yourself. But it's a discussion that has to be done directly with the team like that. More than welcome. More questions? If, if you don't, I will. They don't make questions to me, sir. They hated me. <laughs> they hated me. Yes. avoid this protein corona formation because we want to make particles to be able to target a given cell or everything that we use. Okay. So I worked for a couple of years trying to avoid the protein corona formation. Then there is two or three groups in the world they are trying to coat the particles, mimicking the particles, making the they break down the cell and you try to coat the particles with the cell components. So the cell is kind of invisible when in the blood stream. Then the protein corona formation become a very hot topic. The point is, uh, what I'm trying to do, I'm trying to model the protein corona formation and control the protein corona formation to understand biological processes. First, it's difficult to control. We are now playing with two or three proteins. We can, we can work with a serum, for example, but con the fine control of serum is very difficult. But what I have now doing is first, basic experiments where I can see the structure of the protein 
and I'm trying to correlate with that with the biological response. For example, uh, we, we don't know yet if this HSA secondary structural change can trigger microphages, for example. If we can prove that, it's very hard because I can tell you we, we can now see the protein. If we look the spectra of the protein, we can see if the body is going to respond or not. This is one of the, my first videos. And the second one, I have a PhD student that was able to find out that we only have a monolayer of a protein put on a monolayer that was preformed. And you can put in very complex systems, even in this case, the particle goes inside of the cell, they do not aggregate, they are colloidally stable. So this is a way that we are trying to use to put particles inside of the cells. Yeah, and then we are going to use this 3D stuff to see where the particles are going. Did, did you follow my answer? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. We can talk later. It's but uh, tomorrow. Yeah, I can talk a little. Okay, my my goodness. I was thinking when you were talking about the first thing that uh, I kind of wrongly mentioned that we had a later discussion about in a later super but that doesn't mean that we cannot get any additional information whatsoever if we're working with nanoparticles that are entering. Very good question. What happens? Uh, imagine 2D first. The pixel. My my hands are making a pixel. Okay. I have another pixel here, another pixel, another, another. So let's imagine that we have a, an array of pixels here. Let's imagine that the pixel 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters. Right. If I take a soccer ball. I can use this array and define a soccer ball because the soccer ball is larger than the pixel. If I take this device and put inside of a pixel, I may say this guy is there, but I don't know where in this given space. Did you follow? Yes. So what happens? If I have now in 2D, then you have to go for 3D. If I have a contrast that is big enough, so let's imagine that we have a silica matrix that is doped with gold particles. Okay, silica is nothing compared to gold particles that have a huge electron density. So imagine that all arrays are made of silica, and you have one pixel. Imagine that this is the particle, the pixel is here. And this pixel has a huge intensity. Then I can say, although I don't see the particle, I know that especially in the space, the particle is there. But I cannot define it. It makes good, right? But now imagine that the particle is in between pixels. Then you have half of the intensity per pixel. And let's imagine that we have one third in one side and two thirds in the other. Then things become very tricky. So, answering, you cannot see them. You might localize by pixel. It's very challenging. Maybe the reviewer will not trust you, <laughs> but they will be there. But if you want to see, you have to work with. Elements that are bigger than the pixel or the voxel <laughs> that is your pixel in 3D metals. Okay, this is why I always work with 100 nanometers nanoparticle because I'm sure that my element is way bigger than the 30 nanometer resolution of my voxel. Then, with a couple of voxels, I can be sure that I, I have a particle there. 
Do you understand? It's, it's very difficult. I have to use your hands and uh, okay. But yes, you can precisely say, you, you can say that inside of the pixel, although some of the reviewers do complain a lot, I would say. But nowadays it's, it's a little bit easier because you can provide raw data as a supplementary material. And there are a lot of people doing that. Then you provide the raw data, you provide the process data, and then you say, oh, you can pre reprocess the data if you want, because the data is there. I, I know one person that does a lot of it. And he published science in the <laughs> So it's possible. But of course, we, I, we don't have his name. Uh, <laughs> Yes. Thank you. Thank you. No, 